Hello, and welcome to the Servant Leadership Today podcast. My name is Sam Shinta, and I'm joined by Rick Kite. Each episode, we talk with leaders in a variety of fields about character, the common good, and the importance of civic virtue. Hi, Rick. How are you doing today? Pretty good, Sam. Hope you're enjoying this lovely fall day. We have got a, a special treat today for our podcast. Uh, so far, we've only met with one person at a time, and today we're lucky enough to have three guests. Uh, today's guests are members of Wisconsin Women in Conservation, an organization started this year that brings together Wisconsin women landowners to connect and learn about conservation practices, resources, and funding opportunities, all in the name of stewardship. Dr. Esther Shakina is a research agronomist at Michael Fields Agricultural Institute with more than 20 years of sustainable agriculture research experience in both India and the United States. In addition to leading Wisconsin Women in Conservation, she is researching cover crops and industrial hemp with the goal of developing production practices that encourage diversity in organic cropping systems. Jennifer Nelson works with the Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Services, or MOSES, facilitating farmer education and farmland access. With her partner, she co-owns Humble Pie Farm in Plum City, Wisconsin, growing certified organic bedding plants, produce, and flowers. Jennifer has managed and been on the board of multiple farmers markets in the Midwest. Val Dantoin is a conservation coach for Wisconsin Women in Conservation. Val's Full Circle Community Farm is located outside of Green Bay. They focus on grazing, permaculture, riparian buffers, wetlands, organic and pollinator habitat. Valerie is a farmer teacher who models her 250 or 240 acre farm after the workings of natural ecosystems. She has a BS in bacteriology, a master's degree in agronomy, and an all but dissertated PhD in land resources. Valerie developed and teaches 20 courses in the sustainable food and ag systems program at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College. Welcome all of you today. It's great to see you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you for having us, Sam. Well, this is a great organization and I've uh, been able to read a, a bunch of your press releases as well as the website. Why did this organization start? Okay, um, I can go. Um, Wisconsin Women in Conservation is like a partnership of uh, different organizations. We work together mainly because the 2017 census brought out that the number of women farmers are increasing they are like the uh, principal producers, registered as principal producers. They have risen to about 35% in Wisconsin, which is like, there are about 38,500 um, women farmers cultivating as principal producers. And so we wanted to reach them. And research has shown that women kind of learn well in a women-only setting, um, able to share their uh, questions and learning from peers, and, it, it, and they are like hands-on learning with the women-only setting, they are kind of flourish in such situations. And so we were contemplating of how to reach these women. And that's when our state conservator, um, Angela Biggs uh, of the Natural Resource Conservation Service, she reached us and saying, with the same kind of a focus, like, is it something that we could do uh, in order to uh, get things done uh, so as to have uh, uh, you know um, this, uh, this partnership going to help women farmers in conservation so we got that going and that's how this whole thing started and why is it important uh, you mentioned the, the 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 fact that women are underrepresented why is it important though to recognize women as uh, stewards of the land I'll jump in on this one I think it's really important because uh, we women are partners usually on farms and we help our husbands often or our partners, but we have this underlying care and stewardship ethic where we really want to see more coming um, from our agricultural lands. We want to see uh, habitat for wildlife. We want to see birds and pollinators and other critters 
share the landscape with us. We don't want just corn and soybeans. We want lots of things out there enjoying the farm with us. And I notice in, in talking about the organization, you're, you're casting a rather broad net. So it's not just farmers, it's not just uh, producers, you're also talking with hunters and fishers and conservation folks as well. Um, why did you decide to create such a broad-based uh, organization? What was the importance there? Okay, um, so we are basically talking to all kinds of landowners and um, conservation is a part of all that. And we have uh, like, you know, Wisconsin has a lot of wooded lands. And so they also want to have practices that can, they can put their wooded lands under conservation. So in, in that, uh, in, in, a, in our efforts to reach those kind of folks as well, we have resources who can, who can come and talk to them about what kind of conservation measures they can take with respect to um, wooded lands and uh, like wetlands and prairie restoration and stuff like that. And during those efforts, we find this partnership growing that people who are in fisheries and people who are in um, other uh, wildlife management who want to partner with us will come and talk to the women as well as to what can be done in such situations. And what has the reception been so far? I can jump in here. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having us and Rick. Um, you know, I really, uh, so I'm a coordinator in this program and I, the area that I reach out to and, um, and try to connect women, landowner and farmers with, um, with agencies like NRCS and Pheasants Forever and, and all of these great um, groups that we've been talking about. I do that in Northwest Wisconsin, and I, I focus primarily on three counties, Polk, Barron, and, um, and Dunn counties, and that's just for ease of travel, I think. But, um, but what we found is that um, it's our, this program has been so well received. It's like there's, you know, there's all these people working in conservation and working in agriculture, and we all have like similar goals. And it helps so much to have this unifying program to, to bring people together. We had a, um, an educator network gathering via Zoom last week, and there were over like over 120 people on that just from the state of Wisconsin working in different areas with women, farmers and landowners in conservation. So it's really, it's been really, really well received. And, um, and I think it's something that's really needed. That, that's, um, we kind of work in tri-county clusters in different regions of Wisconsin just to help people connect more rather than having a broad base. But then we also bring in people from other parts of the state through some webinars, which people have expressed interest in. And those topics really brought in about 250 people every webinar, and there was such great interaction. And then we follow up with like the sharing of resources and answering those questions. And so it's been well received. And then we have find more and more people joining us in all these programs. I know that I hosted a, a bonfire basically on my farm back in August. Uh, so we started in the late afternoon and we looked at riparian buffers and uh, the wetlands we have on the farm, our vegetable, our organic vegetable operation, our managed grazing of beef, and even our, our wind turbine, which powers the farm. We had 50, 60 women out at the farm for a late lunch. And then just um, visiting and getting to know each other. And it was so cool to see People I didn't even know were in my neighborhood, women who got the word and said, I want to be part of this. I have land. I manage land. And I want to meet other like-minded women, especially, and talk about the, the issues and the barriers and the wonderful ideas. And I don't want to feel alone in this. I want to feel supported. That was really cool. To the best of my knowledge, um, and I, I just maybe it was because of the unique name that you've given this here, um, I've not been able to identify other 
similar initiatives uh, across the country. Are you aware of any, or is this something new and fresh that just is happening to start here in our, uh, our own backyard in Wisconsin? Um, efforts like this are happening around the country, but not in an organized way like us. They reach like conservation efforts are being directed towards women, but this as a entity and working in partnership at a state level, we are kind of piloting this program and we hope that we will be the kind of example that the nation will want to follow. Yeah. At, so what are the challenges, Ben? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Val. Sorry. <laughs> Perhaps because we do have strong women in leadership positions, including at the head of our Natural Resource Conservation Service and just in the Wisconsin Farmers Union, which supports this effort. And a lot of different places, we have good, strong women leadership, and we're like, let's let's involve more more women, and that's an outgrowth of who's at the table now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an important point because out of the four organizations that we are working together, three are headed by women, and also the Natural Resource Conservation, our state conservator and of NRCS is a woman, and so we have great. Um, help from every department. And uh, as we go forward, they are, they are with us every step of the way. You, you know, and I know you're a fairly new organization, uh, but, but what have you identified some challenges thus far or run into challenges thus far? Or, ha I mean, it sounds from what you're sharing that a lot of this has been very positive. The reception has been very positive. I think one of the things um, that I've, experienced as a coordinator of this project, you know, when I've worked on a lot of, with Moses, I've worked on a lot of grant funded um, programs and pilot programs. And, and I kind of thrive in that space of like, you know, creating the ship while you're sailing it. And I, I think there can be, there can be challenges with that in just like, um, learning what's going to, when you're creating something new and you're trying to unify, um, you know, a, a bunch of different people in different areas, there can be challenges just with communication and, um, and just like figuring out the best way to do things. And so, so I think, um, I think as we move forward, we're really one of the, one of the big things, and, and Esther can probably speak to this a little bit too, but one of the big parts of this program is that it's really based on research. We're working with um, with two women who have extensive knowledge on how researching how women learn and and um, and then how to use that to to like create effective change and to um, you know like help people get into programs like conservation programs that they wouldn't necessarily, like they would want to do, but they wouldn't know how to take those steps. So, so this program is really research-based and we're, we're kind of like, um, we're doing like these really thorough evaluations at each event and um, each different thing that we do so that we can accommodate um, what, the, what the participants are looking for as we go. I don't know, Esther, do you have some more on that? Yeah, um, you brought up a good point, Jennifer, because we are also evaluating every one of our events. Um, so the participants who are the women landowners or farmers themselves kind of go through an evaluation form and give us feedback. And then we study all that together and then pivot our events based on the need and how we can serve them better. Like, so those are express needs and then we kind of based on the research that's been done before, as well as the feedback that we are getting now, and then keep pivoting our events to, to, you know, to actually tailor to the needs of women and how they would like to have it. And so one of the major thing that we do is the time to network. We, I can very strongly say that we are low, low on content. We don't just thrust a lot of resources at them, but we provide more time for networking to talk to their peers, to learn from each other. And that's what women really like, that they can share what they're good at, they can share their doubts, they can ask questions, they can learn from what people have done. People like Val, our conservation coaches in our uh, program, 
And they go out and speak of what they've done on their land. They open up their farm for other people to walk their land and learn about stuff. And that's what she was talking about, the field day where people were hanging out till 9 and 9.30 in the night, even though it started at 3.30, 4 o'clock. And so that's the kind of um, interaction they have. And thanks to people like Val who are willing and open to host these people on their land. Um, I'm just trying to get a better idea of where your focus is. So many agricultural organizations are really focused on politics and they're doing political advocacy. And it sounds like you're, you're looking at cultural change and that's where your emphasis is. Is that right? Are, are you also involved in politics or are you mainly just focusing on like education, relationship building, that sort of thing? I would say one of the reasons I decided to be part of this and I was so happy to be invited is because it is about the greater good and it's not about politics. It's about how to grow food that's healthy for us all, how to keep the soil on our farms and keep the manure and other agricultural inputs out of our rivers and streams. We want to make a better ecosystem. Like I said before, we want the um, co-inhabitants of the land to share the space with us while we are also feeding the world. We think we can do both things, that feeding the world doesn't mean we have to plow fence row to fence row. We think we have a way of being in harmony with nature while we still farm and enjoy this beautiful breadbasket area that we are privileged to live in and farm and it's not at all political. In fact, th that kind of topic never came up around the campfire. It was much more, um, what are you doing to grow food and how are you growing it? And let's just share our common ground. We talk more about uh, sustainable agricultural practices, regenerative farming, and about how to keep the soil on the land and how to grow no-till how to do rotational grazing, what are the practices that we can ensure that enhances the soil health for continued cropping and those kind of stuff. We are advocating for regenerative farming and not in any way politics at all. And there are a lot of programs that's available with natural resource conservation services that people are not aware of. So our, especially women. So we are main focus is to bring it to their attention that these are the programs that are available. If you want to do any of these, then you can use these resources to benefit your farm. So that's one of the goals as well. Uh, how and much I, of your membership practices uh, organic farming? Is it, it, are you a completely organic organization or is you could, some organic farmers, some conventional farmers? We have, we support conventional and organic farms. Mm -hmm. Myself, I work, I mean, I am an organic farmer, so, so that's my, that's my focus, but, but we reach out, we, like Esther said, there's so many programs that, um, that are available that women aren't aware of, or there's like a, there's like a, um, you know, like a cultural block to going in and signing up for that program. I don't know how to do that. I feel intimidated by the staff, I, I haven't done this before, you know, so, so you're right, we are really trying to like overcome some of these cultural barriers. I am a, um, a farmer mom, I have an eight year old son. And so a lot of the women that we talk to are our mothers as well. And I think that really affects how you think about the world and how you think about farming and, and what your values are with that. And, um, and so so for me, I, I feel like a big part of this is like empowering women to, um, to have the tools and the relationships that, that can then help them, um, you know, enroll in some of those programs. So that would affect political change, right? Like, I mean, cultural change affects that certainly, but, but that's not our, our goal. Our goal is to really um, connect and, and empower women in these spaces. And one of the important things that you would find interesting if you come to one of our events is that we meet people at all, all levels, like people who already know about regenerative farming, while people, women who come in with no idea of what it is. 
So we talk to them about, okay, if you walk into an office, what are the first questions you will ask? Hey, what can I do with my farm? What is the, you know, just taking them through that journey. And there are people who help because the women themselves have walked through that. So they're like, okay, this is what I did and this is what I can do. And then there are people who have already signed up through program for programs and have implemented stuff on their land. So we meet women at all, all different levels and we help them through the journey no matter where they are at. How many, how many, um, how many people are getting into farming? And, and I'm talking about people who are coming to your events and so forth are fairly new to farming, have not done this before. So like, um, and so you're helping them learn at the same time. And how many have in, say inherited, they grew up farming and, and this is what they've learned to do and they decided they want to stick with it as a way of life? I can answer that question. Teaching in the classroom and in a program where we have new students every year, about a third of the students are from a farm background where they grew up on a family farm, have some land. They want to maybe think of taking a new direction. A third of the students have no experience at all on farms and they're more interested in, in growing food and they think uh, they, they feel a calling to be part of the landscape. So they're very interested in, in learning uh, from scratch. And then the last third of people actually have been very active themselves in farming, but again, want to take their farm in a new direction. And interestingly, in our associate degree program at the technical college, we have more than 50% of the class is typically women. And I don't know if that's because I'm the main teacher in the program, or if it's just because these women haven't had access to a typical, more um, farm business type programming that has been in the educational sphere. But we have women who are definitely launching their own farm, a lot more interested in herbs and vegetables, smaller scale animals. And so it's, it's a great way to help people find a pathway to be on the farm. And then this programming in women in conservation further helps women bake right into their farming adventure. They're going to bake conservation and care of the land and stewardship right into that new farm. There are women who kind of own 20 to 40 acres like small farmers and they want to have a pollinator habitat because they care for the bees and the future of crop production. And so they would want to know how do we do that? Like we don't have any idea. Where do we put that in practice? And there are some people who come in asking like, oh, I want to really learn about what farming is. So I'm, I don't have land that I can put under conservation, but I'm here to learn about it. So all kinds of women come in and that's very encouraging to us. So this is re the last, um, well, a couple of decades have been really challenging for, for farms. Um, how much are you helping uh, the small farms become economically viable? And, and what, are some, what are some things that you do to, to help? I know you're involved with the farmer markets, uh, Jennifer, like you're involved with that and there must, and I, you mentioned connecting to resources and grants, but are there some things that are especially significant that you're finding that, that are very helpful? Yeah, uh, I can speak to that. I, um, you're right. I mean, climate change and, um, you know, all of the, the larger um, just landscape of food production and the food system, it's, it is challenging for small farmers. But I think there's a lot of hope in, um, in what we can do just even like, like Esther said, you know, right here at, at my farm, we have 16 acres and, um, and just what we've been able to do here is it, it's very, I think it really surprises people um, when you realize how much food you can grow on a little bit of land. Um, what, what we do, like specifically to this program, the, just the ability to, um, to, to get 
uh, connected into some of these funding programs and um, some of these other things can really support farmers in, you know, if you, if you can get some of your land into CRP or you can, you know, get some help if you were working on a, um, actually a um, conservation plan right now on my farm, we're working on getting some fencing. Um, so to help the, an NRCS can help pay for that fencing. Um, so to, to help with some of those things can really be beneficial to small farms, not to have to, you know, can't, farming is capital heavy. And so whatever help you can get um, in those things is really helpful. I think also like, as you, as you put more, and, and Val can speak to this, as you put more, um, you know, sustainable practices on your land, like we had a, we held a field day in my area um, at Marianne Holmes Farm, and she has a super, she's on a sand shelf, and it's super sandy soil, and it's been a drought year, and her pasture was lush and beautiful, and her cows were happily running around, you know, it, it's amazing to see what putting in some of these sustainable practices, no-till and pasture renewal and some of these things can really do to benefit the land so it has more resiliency um, going forward. So I, so I think it's about empowerment of the women finding programs to help with some of these capital expenses and then also um, just, you know, putting some of these sustainable practices in place that really benefit the land. Well, you, you okay. kind of anticipated my next question. I was going to ask if you have any real success stories and maybe you have some others, of, you know, of, of people that have come to some of your events and, and really learned something that's been valuable, that's been able to transform what they do. I think the way women work when they come to these events is the, the networking, the sharing. So we don't in this particular program teach economic sustainability, but we all know that if you're not profitable, you're not gonna stay on the landscape. So we definitely know that's part of it. And just sharing with each other what we've done on our farms, what works, what doesn't. Um, we want to also stress cooperation in the marketplace over competition, because as you know, farmers are great at beating each other over the head, uh, the race to the bottom, and, and see who can sell product uh, a little bit cheaper than their neighbor. We don't want to be about that. And so when we build this support network for women, we are also sharing our expectation that farmers will have a sustainable lifestyle and not burn out and not be too Poor. Now, I think the programs may be a little bit too young to say we have a lot of success stories of women who have attended, but I do know several women in my neighborhood who came to the event and now met their county conservationists and will be going into the county office and saying, hey, I have 32 acres and I was thinking about grazing animals and I would like to get some help in planning some fencing for my farm. And so in that sense, they will know what programs they can access. And then that will help them have a success story in the coming years. So we're just laying that groundwork at this point. To add to what Val said, we've had like a lot of women farmers who have expressed interest in what they want to do. And they've kind of come to a point where they have a goal for their farm and what they want to do. And they've had people walk their farm in order to tell them the right spots to do the right thing. Like people have talked about prairie land, restoring some land to prairies. They've talked about pollinator habitats. They're talking about woodland conservation. And so uh, there's also a woman who through a program was able to sign up for a high tunnel through our program. And so we have a lot of interest that has been generated and hope put things on paper that yes we want to go forward and so as Val said probably in the next year or so we will actually see things on the ground but there has been definitely an uptick of uh, the love for conservation and the, the plans to actually implement it on the land. So yeah, I, you know, Rick was referring before to the fact that uh, farming, obviously a very difficult profession, and we're seeing lots of folks not continuing the family farm. 
have you thought about outreach to younger women? Uh, maybe those who are still in, say, high school or college in terms of trying to find that next generation of, of stewards as well. I can speak I'm, to that. Uh, oh, Val, you go, can speak to that. Go ahead. I, I was just saying there, there's a great number of FFA organizations and some state high school teachers, and they can tell you also that there's a ton of young women who want to somehow stay connected to the land and that would be a next logical step is to be talking to the, the FFA groups and the high school teachers who interact in the classroom with young women. And so certainly um, just having them come along to some of the programming would be very beneficial. Yeah, we, um, so this is near and dear to my heart as well, because I have a um, an elementary ed degree. I used to teach kids and I, and I think that this, I've seen the power of growing things for children and what that does even just for their self-confidence and their health when they're eating healthy fruits and vegetables. And it's, it's so good. And so, um, well, I was going to say, so the Wisconsin Farmers Union, who is another partner on this project, they have Camp Kenwood and they have some great, they have a, a um, a youth advisory council, which is great. So for any of your listeners, um, if they have, you know, teenage kids or tween kids, tween age kids, that, that is a great place to start with that. Um, and, oh, I know as well, we really welcome, like at my field day, um, this past September, I think we had like eight children, eight to 10 children. So we welcome, we, we have some children's activities. I mean, they're, they're self, we're not offering childcare or anything like that, but, but we do have some things available and we welcome. And that was one of my favorite parts was we hold learning circles where we, um, we all like, we toured the farm and then like Val said, then we hung out and we all shared our stories and talked through some things and made connections. And I would see like, you know, a mom sitting there and then she would have to go like give a hug or <laughs> like, redirect somebody and then come back to the circle and sit down and keep talking. And so we are very, um, very cognizant that women are often accompanied by children and we welcome that. What I find fascinating is that, you know, we, we hear the challenges to the land uh, all the time, right? Climate change, use of uh, land use practices, folks that are working on the land. And yet, to me, you've created an organization centered on a, a, a hopeful look at things. Are, do you feel hopeful about the future of our land practices here in the in the Midwest and 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 the fact that you're getting women involved? And is, is this going to change that help change that paradigm? I can answer that. Yes, it's a resounding yes. We do believe that we have it in us to change. Um, so we are more focused on conservation as mm, a goal so, uh, in order to retain the topsoil and carrying out these kind of regenerative farming practices that enable the land to be sustainable for a longer period of time. And more so as women, we are nurturers, we take care of our family, we want the best for our family and that extends to our land. And so when you speak to the woman, she always works from the heart right? Like many a times it's not, when we talk about a family, it's always not about economics that we work with, right? We take care of our children no matter what. And it's the same way I see women. There are so many women who sometimes when they share their stories, I see tears in their eyes when they talk about their land, how they went away from their land and how they came back to reclaim their land, uh, how um, through the loss of their husband, their, the land came to them and they have to take care of it and they don't know what to do. And so they put even like at 70, they put in so much effort to learn things so that they can do something for the land that has fallen into their hands. And so that gives me great hope. And I'm sure, uh, yes, we will keep it going. Yes, definitely. There have been times over the last 30 years in my farming career that my husband and I felt like we were pushing a boulder up a hill with sustainable farming. And then we get tired and then 
another group of helpers comes in and says, we're going to help you push. And maybe this time the boulder is going to roll over the other side of the hill. We'll get sustainability really working uh, in a broader cultural sense so that it's not just a few rogue farmers trying to fix a broken system. And, and that's what I really appreciate about this group and this effort is the, the idea that women do have a say in the future of what the landscape should look like. And if we embrace more women and our role on the landscape, I think only good things will come of it. And that's what I'm looking forward to for the future of this project. I guess, you know, I, I second that resounding. Yes, we are. We are absolutely hopeful. I mean, we don't really have a choice, right? We have to change things. It's pretty obvious, I think. And this is a way to do it. You know, it's, it's, I think there's this tendency for all of us to kind of like, forget that we do have power to change things. And we, you know, we see things in the media and all of that, that, that affect us. And yet, you know, on our little 16 acres, we have so many bumblebees and so many, um, you know, hummingbirds. I was just reading about the hummingbird crisis. I, I have like tons of hummingbirds just because of what we plant here, you know? And, and so I think there is a great, I mean, those are just little examples, but there, there are so many ways to make change in your sphere, in your sphere of influence. And, and so I feel really hopeful just being connected. And, and I think as well, just like as we've put out, you know, as we've done these events this year and as we've kind of gotten this ball rolling this year, the response to it has been huge. And that also makes me very hopeful. Well, Dr. Uh, Esther Shakina, uh, Jennifer Nelson and Val Dantoyne from Wisconsin Women in Conservation, thank you so much for sharing a vision of hope, a vision of stewardship, both of the land and of building stronger communities in the process. And thank you for all of your work. Thank you so much, Sam, for having us and sharing this hope with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rick.